Ave Maria. Today we celebrate the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, a central doctrine of our faith, one of the pillars on which Christianity is built. You cannot be a Christian if you do not believe in the Blessed Trinity. Yet this doctrine, this is a mystery which is beyond our understanding. At best, we can have analogies or similes, metaphors, but as to its actual significance and meaning, we'll have to leave that for eternity when, please God, we will see him face to face. Yet, whilst we are in this Valley of Tears, whilst we are journeying towards eternity, we should try to delve a little into the mystery, its meaning, and its significance for us in our journey. In a nutshell, why is the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity so important to us in our journey? It's because at heart it teaches us that God loves us and that we have been called not to be servants or slaves or even creatures, but we have been called to be children of God. We are called to be members of his household. We are called to an intimate relationship with each person of the Blessed Trinity, with God himself. I said we cannot be Christian if we do not believe in the Blessed Trinity. It is natural for human beings to believe in some superior being, some supernatural being, some divine being, a God. And every civilization, every culture, every society has had, has in the present also, a belief in God of some kind. But when we look at the vast array of the different beliefs in God or gods or goddesses, what do we notice? Well, we can start off with Egypt. They were the gods of Egypt, were they not? Male and female. And with them were associated a mythology relating essentially to the origin of all things. And invariably we'll find that there were gods and goddesses. Because the human mind cannot grasp that there could only be God with one gender, as we would say today. There had to be another gender. The human mind couldn't grasp the fact that there could only be two. If there are two, there must be a third and a fourth and a fifth. So it is natural for the Egyptians to think that there were many gods and goddesses. And when we go to the other civilizations, that of Rome or Greece, we find the same thing. There were gods and goddesses. And what do we notice? If you read the classics, such as the Aeneid by, by Virgil, or the Odyssey by Homer, or any of the great poets of Greece and Rome, we'll find that these gods were suspiciously, suspiciously like human beings. They were jealous, envious, lustful, deceitful, they had some good qualities, just as we do. They were just, they were loving, and so on. So they were just super human beings. When we go to the other side of the ocean, to the, to the Aztecs and the Incas, we find gods and goddesses as well. And in the, that part of the world, they were very much like the gods of the Phoenicians. They were bloodthirsty. They demanded sacrifice, human blood. And they had lots of mythologies about them. But one thing we notice about all of these gods and goddesses, they 
were localized. The gods of the Egyptians were different from the gods of the Romans. In fact, when Rome conquered any country, any nation, what did the Romans do? They took their gods into the Roman pantheon. I think it was the emperor um, Tiberius, um, I might be wrong, it might be later, who was quite, who was, I think it's Aurelius, who was quite willing for Christ to be included among the Roman gods. He would be one of them. They're quite happy with that. In that case, there'll be peace for Christians. But Christians said, no, he's not one of your gods. He is God. And now we come to the nub. Because when God revealed himself to Abraham, he didn't call himself, he didn't, he said, come out of the, out, leave your father's house and also his gods, because Abraham was from Ur in Chaldea. He said, come and I will give you a land. So God took him out of a pagan environment and God revealed himself to Abraham slowly and of course to Abraham's descendants, Isaac and Jacob. And they became the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. He became the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And that's how he was called. But they had no name for him. And what was striking was this God behaved as if he were in charge of everything, for the simple reason he was. And later on, when he revealed himself to Moses, he was even more explicit. He called himself, Moses says, whom shall I say sent me? He said, I am who am. That is his name. To be, in other words. In English, his name means to be. That he is existence itself. And so we have now the revelation of a God who is singular and that he's not God of a local place, but rather he is the universal. He is above all other gods as the psalms, psalmist tells us. And that his very nature is to be existence. Now, the Israelites had come out of Egypt, where there were many gods. And so they were very familiar and very comfortable with polytheism, the idea of there being many gods. So God had to hammer it into their heads again and again and again. There's only one God, me. And they would backslide. They'd go into worship in other gods. And God hammered it into their heads until he could take no more. And then he sent them off to Babylon. And after Babylon, they came back and they were adamant, fixed. There was only one God, period. And so at that point... God had to develop the idea. And he did this in many ways, speaking through the prophets, but always veiled. Because again, human nature, as I said at the beginning, finds it abhorrent that there should only be one God and nothing else. In fact, the Roman philosophers, so the Greek philosophers, asked the question, if there's only one God, he must be intelligent, because we look at the creation. The stars move in definite order. There's a pattern. The sun rises every day, more or less at the same time. It sets more or less at the same time. The moon rises every month, and it does what it does. There's order. We plant seeds, they grow. There's order everywhere we turn. So whoever created this must be intelligent. But if he's intelligent, what does he think about? Because if you have a brain, you must think. We think it, not we. So they ask, well, what does he think about? And they couldn't answer the question. Because what could occupy a mind so great, so powerful, as to create all of this? What could occupy such a mind? How long would you observe an ant walking on the ground. 
yes, when you first see it, it's curious, you think, what's it doing? But you wouldn't spend the rest of the day looking at this ant, would you? So if God has such an infinite mind, he wouldn't spend much time looking at us, would he? Well, many of us, so it could be. But the point is that we wouldn't be sufficient interest. In fact, Scripture tells us that all of this like a speck of dust before God. So that was the first question. They couldn't answer. The, they couldn't find an answer to the question, what does God think about? Then the other question they ask, well, if God is good, and he must be good, look at all the good things around us, the beautiful sunrise and sunset. Look at the flowers blooming. Look at the valleys and the mountains. Look at some of us, we're good. So if all of this goodness is around us, there must be a good God who created it. So if he's good, then he must do what? You must love. Because if you're good, you love. That's the, that's the fruit of goodness. And they couldn't answer that either. And so they were perplexed. But in the meantime, God was, in fact, revealing himself bit by bit to the Israelites, to the Jews. And we find this revelation in the Old Testament. I've loved you with an everlasting love, says God to us. But it was only at the fullness of time that those questions could be answered. And they were answered by the fulfillment of the prophecies. Because God is intelligent and because all things are open to him, past, present and future, God could determine at what point he would intervene in human history. And he gave indications, signposts of this in the writings of the prophets, in the Psalms. And this is what we call prophecy. And we could see it being revealed bit by bit at the fullness of time, when an angel descended on Nazareth to a virgin. And when the virgin was asked that question, on which our salvation depends, are you willing to give to God a human nature? And she said, yes, let it be done to me according to your word. The word became flesh. And at that moment, human history changed. And these questions that the philosophers had been asking, if God is intelligent, what does he think about? If God is good, whom does he love? Is being now answered by the word made flesh, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How? Well, if we just have an overview of the New Testament, we can see it at the, at the very beginning of St. John's Gospel. In the St. John's Gospel begins, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And that answers the first question. If God is intelligent, what does he think about? If we have a thought, we give substance to that thought with a word. I have an idea in my head. You don't know what it is, do you? But if I were to say dog, then immediately you know what that idea is in my head. I'm thinking of a dog, I give it a word, you grasp the word, and the word becomes part of your knowledge. So you also have that word, and this is what uh, um, St. John is telling us, that in the beginning, before anything was, in the beginning was the word. God had an idea. And what is this idea? It's a word. What is that word? Scripture tells us it's the image of the living God. In other words, God's idea, God's word, is himself. 
As we grow older, we become more conscious of ourselves and we have a better and better idea of who we are, of what we are as we grow older. Our whole history is summed up. Each day is increased and augmented until it reaches its fullness. And so this word is a perfect copy of God's nature. So the only thing that could occupy an infinite mind for eternity is itself. God thinks of himself. In other words, he knows himself. And this knowledge of God is so perfect, it becomes a person. So in the beginning was the word, the idea. The word was with God, the thinker. The word was God, the same. So everything that the Father, the, the God has is now in his word. So you have two, you have God and the word. Now there's a little difficulty here that I'm going to try and explain. But I'll do that a little later. So, or perhaps I better do it now. This word is a person because God is a person. It's a personal God. It's not some vague power, but a personal God we're speaking about. That personal God said to Abraham, I. He said to Moses, I am. So it's personal. Christ would reveal that the thinker, God, is a father. Now, the moment you say father, in other words, what do you have? Offspring. Agreed? If you say mother, offspring. Agreed? If you say brother, sibling. If you say uncle, you have a niece or nephew. Agreed? So these are correlative terms. So when Christ revealed that God was father, he was saying that God had a son. And this is what our Lord tells Nicodemus. God so loved the world, he sent his only son. Because God had only one word, himself. So, we have father and son. They are co-eternal. When does a man become a father? The man, we're talking in human terms. A, a, man, a, a man reaches a certain age, say 30. He marries, he has a child. At that moment, he becomes a father. When he has a child, even though he's older, but he was not a father before he had a child. And so God was always father. And the son always existed. The second question that the philosophers asked was, if God is good, whom does he love? Well, if you have two persons, they must love each other. Because persons love one another. And so the father loves the son, as our Lord tells us in the scriptures. But what kind of love is it? It is not like our love. This love is a love of God for himself, or better still, the love of the father for the son and the son for the father. And this means that there is a bonding, a breathing out together. The father and the son love each other and they breathe out together their love, who is also another person, the Holy Spirit, because breath, breathing, is spiritual. And so we have these three persons. Now, in the Gospel, you notice what our Lord said to his disciples. All authority has on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's speaking according to his human nature. Because according to his divine nature, he had all authority, he's God. But according to his human nature, all authority has been given to him. He says, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them, listen now, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So here we have three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's only one God. There are not three gods. 
The Father is God, absolutely. The Son is God, absolutely. The Holy Spirit is God, absolutely. But they're not three gods. Because our Lord said, in the name, not the names. So how do we explain this? We have to ask two questions. What and who? Which is related to the two questions the Greek philosophers, Plato, asked. If God is intelligent, what does he think about? If God is good, whom does he love? So we have two questions to ask now. What and whom? The question what is answered by a nature. What is this? This is a pulpit. What is it made of? It's made of wood. What? What is this? This is a dog. What is this? This is a bird. What is this? This is light. It describes the nature of a thing, what, it is, what its substance is, what it is constituted of. But when I ask the question, who? We are talking about person. So I wouldn't say, who is this? Because this is a pulpit. It has no life, no personality. But when you see another human being, you say, who is this? Oh, this is Philip. And this is his wife, Susan. Who? If I meet you, I say, who are you? Not what are you. I can see what you are. You're a human being. A man or a woman. You're a human being. But I say, who are you? And you introduce yourself. I am, and you give your name. And so here, when we talk about God, we're talking about nature. What? So the word God answers the question, what? The nature. But when we ask who, the Father will say, I am the Father, and the Son, I am the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, I am the Holy Spirit. And that makes the distinction. In the case of our blessed Lord, who had two natures, we can say to him, what are you? He can say, I'm God, the Son, or I'm Jesus, the son of Mary, because he has two natures, the what. And so this is what we are celebrating today, this great mystery of the Blessed Trinity. Why is it important? Because it teaches us that God is love and that he is eternal, infinite love. So much so that he created all all things out of love. He created us out of love. He created us so that he could love us. What does he love in us? He loves himself in us. For he has constituted us in baptism to be images of his only begotten Son. And so this is why, as Christians, we keep his commandments, we try to be like his son. We try to be Christian, readily forgiving injuries. This is what we're known for, or should be known for, that we forgive injuries. We love our enemies. What other religion tells us to love our enemies? Only that of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God who has given us his spirit, which is love. Let us then all, trying to grasp as best we can this great mystery, try to live that life of love. For we worship a God of love, and we are the members of his family. We have been privileged to receive baptism, conforming us to Christ, and making us co-heirs with him, and we've been privileged to receive the Holy Spirit, who is love itself, and who is in us, so that we can become 
the incarnate love of God in our world. And our world needs love. It needs God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Santa Maria.